so you know cracked on with that and then um the uh yeah so so i was kind of institutionalized from a very young age uh i don't see that as a, a negative uh indeed it gives you a huge amount of independence and it teaches you very early on to to work with people and deal with different people you know because your bed spaces are right next to each other you're living with them 24 7. you've literally got no choice but to to get on or find a way of of you know working things out um weirdly enough in my dorm when i was eight years old there were four guys in there three of us <laughs> joined the military oh, really? um yeah take take from that what you will um and then yeah went to went to uh, another school near peterborough um and was there from sort of 13 to, to 18 did a levels um and was meant to go to university my school was quite academic and it was like right you know you're all going to university um but I just thought, well, it, you know, I, I can't, I don't, I think if I go to university, it would be a bad thing. I think I'd get, I get distracted very easily by things that most blokes get distracted by. <laughs> and it's probably best if I'm, you know, channeled in the right way. Um, so yeah, did an army scholarship when I was like 16, went down to Limpston, did that. So I had a place at both um, uh, services. And um, I then broke my leg playing rugby and I had to have metal work put in. So I was delayed. So, you know, everything happens for a reason. I really believe that. And, you know, I left school and I was meant to go straight down to Sandhurst or Limps and broke my leg. So there was a delay. I had to go back and like do the medical. And, you know, it, as we all know, that is a long winded process. Um, and so, yeah, went back to like Limps and went back to Sandhurst. Um, did the medical and Sandhurst turned around and said well you can come in January Limpson said come in the summer and I was like well I'll go to Sandhurst then <laughs> and that's literally how it fell um, and yeah went to Sandhurst I was one of the youngest in the intake you oh, know, yeah. uh, 20 um, and uh, I didn't help myself because I turned up the first day and I was actually sponsored by another unit and turned up on the first day and uh, they said right what well, you know, what regiment do you want to join? Who are your choices? And obviously I put Power Reg, top one. And my platoon commander was from the from the unit who I'd been sponsored by. So oh. that went that pretty well. Who was the unit? Grand Day Guards. <laughs> <laughs> you love the guards. Yeah. Um, <laughs> love the guards. And uh, <laughs> Fuck that. Man. Yeah. So he Mind just, he just, I was just like oh in his God. crosshairs. Um, and also, you know, people that, put that down invariably don't get to the end I think we had you know 30 40 guys on the on this sort of open day go yeah I want to join Power Edge and then you go on you know you go on exercise and I joined in January so you go on exercise in like in January in uh, in Wales suddenly no one wants to be in the infantry anymore <laughs> so it was a yeah it was a good gut test um, and then yeah I was you know I went through Sandhurst so I was lucky enough to get a place um and uh, yeah, it all got quite real quite quickly. Um, the, the opening brief when we first went down Sandhurst, you know, you all get chucked in the chapel. And uh, well, this was when oh eight. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, just, it's a highly campaign, mate. Afghan, yeah. yeah. So everyone's like Anirat. Anirat was yeah, still yeah. Right. And So you've yeah, got you've got neck. colour men, colour sergeants. Yeah, mate. Being like, it's not a fucking question of if, it's when. Like you are all going to war, Iraq or Afghanistan when you leave this academy blokes were getting issued desi kit in the final intake really yeah yeah and we had a booster intake so i think it's a lot smaller now and obviously it's very different very different time but at that time like it was a massive like three companies three boosted platoons with like bcrs and like it like there was a it was a surge yeah so we were all there and obviously the competition was like right yeah because everyone's like, I'm going on tour. I want to be with this unit. I want, who's the next unit going on tour? So that's what everyone was trying ah, to do. Ah, mate. Ah, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and it was like, you know, uh, a fantastic environment to be in. Um, but I was well aware that I was 20 years old and I want John the Reg and so did 40 other blokes and I didn't stand a fucking chance in hell. Um, but, you know, I was all right at Fizz and you know, I was all right on the academic side, so I kind of, you know, got a place very much like, we've got our, our eye on you, mate. Like, you know, you're gonna have to deliver. 
and I remember in like the reg um, the board so every other unit you know you turn up to the board and they literally pass you a beer or champagne and go welcome to the club the reg one you turn up mate there's a massive room you're at one end and there's like four colonels and above the other side just for the interview you yeah see yeah, if they yeah, want the, yeah 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 the, the commissioning board so after you've proven yourself in well, I did it in the final intake at Santa. Okay. I think it's now middle. Okay. Um, but it's right at the end. So, you know, it, and like, I think it's a couple of months before you commission. So when you did it, just for mm. people listening yeah. or watching, so you, you go into Sanders, you got your physical test, you got your mental test, all that, all, everything goes with Sanders. And then at the end, the, un- the unit you select is your primary choice. Yeah, you whittle it down to three. Three, okay. Um, and do, they, do all three of them interview you then? I think you could then go down to two, I seem right. to remember. Right, so you right. go into interview for two of them. Um, and yeah, I had another unit as, as a choice, and then, which we imagine. And Dude, then, um, I don't want that. You have to have a backup, mate. You have to. <laughs> you can't have one, two, and three you keep going It's not about okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I get to the reg board, and obviously, you're so nervous. Absolutely breaking it. And you know, you're wearing like a, a stife, you know, a suit, and it's just so awkward. You mean two? No, 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 you, you're wearing a Sebi suit, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, you go in and sat down, and, yeah, they're just, like, good cop, bad copping you. But is it vocational, or what, what kind of interview is it? It's, what uh, kind of interview can it be to get into the military? <laughs> I I, well, into the regiment. I, I mean, I can't... I, <sighs> if you ask me, like, verbatim, what they, I can't remember. But I remember some questions being, you know, the reg have been on two tours of Afghanistan, um, how do you think you can motivate and inspire, you know, battle hardened paratroopers? You're 20 years old, right? Got you. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. who the fuck do you think you are, kind of thing? Fair point. Fair point, Your Honour. <laughs> Listen to this, right? I sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I rocked up on the third tour. I went out the advance party. We were 13. Yeah, yeah, 13. Yeah, yeah. Um, rocked the advance party. Went out there. Um, we were embedded with. We were taken over. The Anglians, I think it was the Anglians, mm. taking over the Anglians. You were over Nadi Ali. Nad, Nad North. Yeah. Nad North, yeah. This is in Kamar, okay? Yeah, yeah. Sit, sit down, have a scarf, put in the, you know, the bloody field kitchen thing, sit down, yeah. have a scarf. I sat with a bunch of Anglians, looked around, and there's a, there's a lad in front of me, and he looked about 18 years old. He was the youngest looking guy there. And I, we were all chatting. I said, um, I can't remember what I asked him, but he said, oh, he replied, I'm not saying his name, he replied with, I oh, missed such and such. Yeah, so I missed uh, I don't know, Smith or whatever. I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> you know what? Cheers you know what Reggie looks like an officer. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. kissing myself. All the hangers like, fucking hell. Sorry, so He looked like 18. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't yeah, believe yeah. it. Yeah, I did like pasty as well. Been out there for six months. Yeah. I moved it. Sorry, I can. Well, we took over from the Anglians on, uh, so I was two pack, uh, over right. in uh, PB1. The eastern flank. Go south of Nez. Price. Nez south. Nez south. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like Babaji area. Yeah. Um, so imagine what a young looking platoon commander. We'll get on to that. Yeah. Um, so I joined with another like young platoon commander as well. And we both went to two power. But um, yeah, just that that uh, that board mate was savage, fucking savage. And I just I've, I've never been less confident in myself ever in front of people. Really? I was just like they have banged me to rights here. They know that I'm <laughs> bluffing it. They know that I'm chancing my arm to get into the parachute regiment. I was like, I don't have any response really. I mean, you know, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. They then did a bit of Reggie history. I was fine on that. Um, then, uh, you know, they'd ask you a question and I'd just go, I'd do the typical thing. They'd be like, so tell me about, you know, Goose Green, what happened? And instead of going, this happened, this happened, this happened, and the end state was this. I went right. So basically, they all turned out and literally dug myself a hole. Um, yeah, you know, like the classic. Like I've got all the knowledge. I'm going to tell you everything, and they just hammered me. Um, so that was a lovely little entrance to the race. But here's a question for you. Yeah. So how do you how how do you how how would you motivate? I'm not. I'm, this is a rhetorical question. How yeah. would you motivate soldiers who battle hard like that um, when you are Bakshi? Not Bakshi. Two yeah, yeah. rocket with no experience. Yeah. I, I mean, the way I see it, the best, the best. What well, Chun Commander's always with big Joe bags when he first rock up, regardless of Afghan or Rats going on or whatever. Yeah, and they're stepping as you know, well as you well know, he's stepping into the tomb with he's the tom up. There's also more yeah. time than you. Um, it's got to be a case of correct me if I'm wrong. You 
like anything, be confident. Be confident in what your own abilities are. Be confident in your training. Go in there and appear confident. Mm. And, and but but measure that with not a cocky bastard. Yeah. yeah. And, and take on the and the invite where you must have seen the platoon commanders. Well, you know the beauty of. No, so far, fast forward. You know, you go and do Brecken, and then you and I love Brecken because it's sort it, 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 it's, it's yeah, Brecken, it's just yeah, the infantry yeah. platoon commander. So everyone yeah. is of a quality of who wants to be in the field. So you're all of a better, you know, and, and yeah, we were all deploying like as well. So some lads are doing a desert kit in Wales in January because <laughs> they're like, here's all your kit and everything else. So you're doing that. I think quite sharpens the mind, you know, and obviously you're seeing the papers and, you know, people forget now, you know, 10 years ago, it was in the fucking news the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you just bell fed that and obviously you're highly tuned to it as well. So did Brecken, did P Company, finished P Company, went down to Colchester, threw my grip bag in a room, got on a transport, went down to Bryce Norton, got on an 18 hour flight to the Falklands. No wings, mate, one pip. Brilliant. Hadn't met the blokes. Turn up, Mount Pleasant Airfield. Uh, right, MH, you are taking your platoon plus, so support company elements as well, going to Onion Rangers, um, and uh, basically you're going to do like live, or basically from section all the way up to platoon live firing for the next two weeks. In the middle of winter, on Onion Range in the Falklands. Day one. Day one. <laughs> and and the best, best of all, mate, there's no lifters because the clag's in, so you're going to tap it. <laughs> Fuck a twenty mile tab. Jen, honestly, <laughs> honestly, that is the gut check and a half. We had to carry half, skirt, <laughs> like basically ammo for yeah. section plus, and then it was getting lifted in later on, or, or driven in by water. So my first detail was right. Here's your platoon. No, my platoons aren't not even turned up. Here are your screws. Here are like you know snipes and heavy weapons section commanders get around a map and go figure it out. And that's all my OC said to me, um, which was the best thing to do, by the way. And um, basically got the map out. I was like, you know, proper bracketing. Like, right, <laughs> I want you to do this. And they're like, sir, just, or not even that, is it? It's just like, boss, just, you know, we'll just take it as like a long snake. We don't, well, it's not tactical, it's non tack And like, this is going to be hard graft. Fuck me, was it hard graft? Um, and the clag properly came in and, and as you so for Onion you've been down there you go over a massive ridge and then come into the valley but it's covered in snow and we got in a boulder field very quickly boulder field with heavy, heavy weapons kit it was honestly one of the most emotional things I've ever done and because I was like right I've got this is shit I've got to be the front man like literally my fucking legs are about the size of that so I'm like <laughs> knees to chest trying to like wade through the uh, thing and then all of a sudden you're on your ass because you're in a boulder field and there are yeah. gaps in it. you know and so everyone's getting strung out licked more and more licked and you know I, I then and it's interesting what you say about confidence and, and borderline arrogance um, GPS went down comms went down we couldn't fucking do GPS. couldn't do the skeds mate everything like literally no, fucking GPS it was non tack doesn't matter Oh, it was map and compass again. Well, I didn't. It didn't. It, it didn't matter. It didn't matter because it then went to map and compass. So I was literally on a bearing, and you know, private whoever was, uh, fuck me, it was Carl Marshall. Actually, Carl Marshall was was the who is now no longer with us. Yeah, he's no, he okay. was killed in thirteen. Was uh, uh, one of the Toms, and he was like, "Fucking hell, right?" So he was just like, "I'll crack on and do it." Um, and he was like the point man and then we were literally like right Marshall get to that point and then we'll march to you and then we'll set you another green line and I sort of I was turning to my section commander and I was just like am I fucking getting this wrong because I really feel like I fucked it up and he went boss honestly no one can do anything now like we've just got to get through it mate dark like everything bold oh my god yeah like from hell and then I was like, okay, at least the blokes are still with me. And literally, as soon as I thought that, I hear, fuck it out, right? Fuck it. Like, the proper chuntering started. <sighs> and I get support company, black t shirt gang, like, literally tabbing right up to me. <laughs> Jen, I thought I was going to get banged out. And they were like, don't care what you're about to say. I'm not fucking interested. We're battering up here and we're doing it in the morning. And I was like, you're fucking not. I'm not, we're not just battering up on top of a mountain in the middle of the Falklands with no fucking comms and there's snow on the ground and there's another snowstorm coming in. So that's when you sort of have to just go, 
I'll, I'll back myself here. Yeah. You kind of do have to listen to me, but I want you to understand why I'm telling you this. They eventually came round to what I was saying to them. Um, and Support yeah. company are easily snappable. Oh, easily mate. snappable. Well, you know. I wonder what it's like in non power edge units. If it's the same, got to be the same. You got to, because because they're also second tour lads, aren't they? So they've done their time as a graph oh, yeah. at rifle company. You know, and I had the privilege of uh, OC three pro mortars, so I know the mentality very well. Um, and I'm a huge fan, but at that point, I felt hiding. You know, I, there was no there was nowhere to hide, and I think that was a really important lesson for my career in the reg, which was don't ever don't ever mis misconstrued your confidence with arrogance. Be transparent, be open, but ultimately, you're firm with the blokes if you believe that is the right course of action, and if you have taken the right. Uh, in, you know, you've consulted your con trusted advisors, uh, which is what I used to call the NC, you know, the corporals and everything. If you've consulted your trusted advisor and they're saying, "Boss, it's the right course of action," you need to fucking hammer it through. It's as simple as that. And you know, I, I was then, yeah, you know, much later on, you know, when you're in Afghan and shit's going really wrong, and you have to be like, "This is bad. It's it can get very worse if we don't now just listen to what I need to tell you to do and you fucking do it." Um, so yeah, I mean that's sort of why you're in the position, and you know why you why you wear the rank. Mm. But never misconstrued that with you know you're God's gift, and never. And I think the reg is a lovely environment where if you ever cross the line, you are fucking snapped back down very yeah, quickly. Chewed up the spot out. Yeah, chewed up the spot out. Yeah, yeah. It's a difficult relationship to manage that with the NCO, with the, with the NCOs, with um all. So from my from my perspective with the snipers mm -hmm. um, was you, you need to because there's so much experience there it's slightly different because I, I was more experienced than them and I was either when I had a section or I was one of the two for the brief times I did there's a lot of experience there and I used to try I somehow I managed to balance with this is most apparent on the tours when I was operating in this section where I'd have a chance it'd be a Chinese parliament because it all well actually for this tour no they hadn't all they weren't all like we've been fully experienced because we ended up with eight or nine Not sharp shoes, eight or nine blokes no what just like, rifle <laughs> we, on the 06 tour we needed more people why don't you chuck them the they turned up from depot some of them have been there for a few months maybe yeah. and they got chucked into snipers a few months in and the army and you haven't had time to nothing nothing how did that roll out at all well this is one of the first this is the first time I realised and this is something again I carry through me throughout is mm. that there is some everyone is good at something mm. no I, I'm going to rephrase that Everyone's got Everyone to bring has to something. Party. Yes, everyone has got something to bring to the party. Mm. It's not always a skill, okay? It can be an element of the personality. Yeah, you know. And then some of those guys, some of them are fucking, some of them were average or less than average than what you, what you expect them to be at certain things, right? Mm. They, I don't envy the position they were in. Going to snipers, like going to like going to mortar straight from depot yeah. or anything in support company, because um, obviously in three power snipers is not support company in. in non reg units snipers are support company okay most 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 non reg units mm. use our words carefully uh, most hat units <laughs> are, uh, <laughs> are um, we can say it here but you're uh, 10 listeners uh, first time I've ever said on the podcast normally we get <laughs> first time that word was ever used it was a yeah. uh, Welsh guard calling herself it <laughs> really yeah. I didn't call it I didn't I say it. anyway I so know. yeah everyone has something to bring to the party mm. and all those guys came so I went on to become snipers later on, on in between the, that tour and the other one and the next one. And some of them, you know, with, with LMG gonna, they just, there was something they were good at. Mm. Yeah, everyone has something. When, when, when your hand is forced mm. to deal, exactly like you said, like in Sanders, oh, in fact, in, in your, in school, mm. in your, when you're in boarding school, when your hand is forced to have to live and breathe with people that you haven't got the choice, mm. you, your hand is forced to them. You, you see people in a different way. Mm. That's yeah, why I yeah. think, the, you, you, and you can appreciate them, and you learn to cope with people better. You learn to bring out the best in them, you learn to bring out the best in you. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting environment. That's one of the reasons why I think that, 
you know, veterans have a lot to bring to Civi Street in terms of yeah. jobs and why they are so well accepted when they in, into teams and and because uh, they know they know what it's like to form teams and be part of a team as well and you know without sort of labouring it I think from an anthropological perspective it's it's fascinating you know most of my time the reason I love the Reg is because there's such a cross section of people but all all you know galvanised by the esprit de corps of what the Reg is about and fundamentally when it comes down to it you're you're most terrified about letting your cat badge and your mates down that's what it comes down to and I think you know bringing that together and, and forming it and moulding it is is an incredible thing that the British Army has through their tribal regimental system other other countries don't have that and people sometimes forget you know you don't think certainly not the way that we do it's so it's it's but it but it's you know it's indicative of the country that we live in because you go man. 20 minutes down the road and someone sounds completely different to what they do up the road you know the accents and like the whole you know different cultural things when you go out of London you know and actually experience what the rest of the country has to offer it's it's, it's incredibly idiosyncratic to certain regions yeah I, um, and I think you know you see that coming through in the army when you kind of see it en masse very quickly Mm. See, that's, that's what I was asking about the cultural thing or not. It's interesting. I went to Arnhem for the 75th mm. and I bumped into a, I say I bumped into, I met for the first fucking time, uh, an ex reg guy called Al Packer. Al, Al, <laughs> is that Jenny's name? Al Packer. Did he, did he, did he turn up with a llama? That's what it is on Facebook. It's Al, <laughs> it's not Al Packer. It's something. With Al Llama. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's it's Al something, right? And um, he he recognised me off the podcast. Funny enough, face for radio, mate. Yeah, face for radio. <laughs> and he lives in Australia now. But mm. we were chatting, and um, he did a. I mean, he's a, he's a lot older than us. He did a study for his degree. I can't remember what job he does now. But he basically did a study. You get, and he sent me his dissertation, or whatever it was. This wasn't a dissertation. He sent me something to study it in. Yeah. And it was a. It's all around uh, camaraderie. Mm. And it was it was a study on camaraderie in construction and the impact of it. Yeah. And the construction was chosen because it was like the, the next it, it's the next closest thing that exists in that strong camaraderie to the military. Yeah. And and I'm it's uh, I'm, yeah, he sent it to me. I'm, I'm about a third of the way through. It's really fucking yeah, interesting. Yeah. It's really no, definitely worth worth the yeah. read. Because yeah. obviously it's camaraderie is not the military. It's cross, cross industry. It's a strong. Yeah. Most, yeah. but it's, it is and and, and sort of um, what has been very apparent is, I guess, you know, when we were in, we sort of saw the rise of social media and how that influences a lot of things. <clears throat> and I know that we're new converts. Like I was, to be honest, like I didn't really get why people would just overshare on Instagram and social media it's and everything. Else. It's like, it is addictive. Yeah, they put a lot of But I mean, you know what I did earlier in the year proved it to me I was like this can be because I was I was very negative on it but this can be used as a force for good are you on about the marathon yeah um, hey you went you you got a few followers off the back of that didn't you <laughs> <laughs> you have not got a face for radio <laughs> uh, yeah well I don't I don't know it just sort of gathered momentum didn't it I think the, the, the problem is uh and people are going to fucking hate me now, but I, you know, loads of people do marathons, and I was like, why the fuck are you doing marathon? Like, it's just, you know, it's just running. Oh, well, you know, it's just running, why don't you do it? So I threw my hat in the ring to get a place, and I got a place. First, you know, one shot, one kill, got a ballot place. So I didn't have to go through a charity. So then I was like, well, I need to do it for a charity, I need to do it for a purpose. You know, who should I do it for? And I was like, well, I actually support our powers, like means, a lot to me personally and I know that it means a lot to guys that I know very well you know it's helped me out it's helped guys I know it's helped me out yeah and you know yeah um, and you know that is something that I can passionately like, drive for um, so dropped them a line said right I'm going to raise money for you and they were like okay you need a social media platform and I was like just do Instagram and I then basically banged up a photo with this is why I'm doing it you know I've, I've done a few tours and came back and 
Was yeah. that the you on the ground? You you in in Afghan? Yeah, 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 yeah. Rent a town. Uh, <laughs> and um, rent a town. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and then just a lot of people got in comms and said, "Oh, that's mega that you're doing it," and uh, you know, let us know how we donate. So, so basically, the process was drive people to the Instagram page as a funnel, direct them to the link, just giving, go on the link, you know, go for your life, mate. Fifteen and a half grand. So, like, converting followers into people, and like I'm, like I was honestly. I couldn't believe it but these are people so I'd say 80% of the people I've never met in my life have donated yeah but right Instagram mate that is it's pictures for a reason right you are good at photos mate so, <laughs> well, I didn't take the photo <laughs> no, I know. it's one of those photos one of those half guys. it's a fucking mega fop like um, and you are not dogged right so <laughs> do you know what I mean mate don't slag dogged off <laughs> probably listening <laughs> Oh, it just draws it in. People love it, and then, as yeah. soon as you got that, boom! What it's this? And then you're reading it, you, you got them. Yeah. How many? What? What was the gen, What was the gender breakdown of the? Of the <laughs> I don't know about that. If you, you must have the. You must have your your. You got the account on your phone. How do if you, you got insights, it'll tell you what? how many. You, the gender. It will tell you how many people are following you, male. How many are female? Shut up! I'm telling you, mate. Mate, I, I don't know. We'll have a look after. Oh, okay. I'm intrigued. I'm going to say. I'm going to say right. <laughs> Well, I'm I gonna go some... for. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go high. I reckon the your female following is at least thirty five. About a multiple percent. Thirty five. Wow. Yeah. Thirty five percent. They, 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 they're non-binary. Yeah. True story. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, it worked. What time did you get in the marathon? Three twenty eight. Pretty good. Which is a course record and body armor. So I, oh, I, you I, did I ran it body armor, didn't you? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, so basically, I. I said, oh, I've got a place in the marathon. Invariably, I told, you know, mates that I served with, and they went, well, anyone can fucking run a marathon. <laughs> yeah. And I said, right, well, I'm not doing it with Bergen because that's done so many times. It's boring. I was like, actually, there can be a bit of a message around here. So, if, you know, every time you deploy, you wear body armor. But, you know, that prote- protects you from bombs and bullets, but nothing protects your mind. You know, and that's what I'm raising money for, and that's what I'm raising awareness for is uh the mental health and there is there's an important uh, point here about you know people think veterans and guys that go on tour are mad bad or sad I don't think that's a truth I think I think people have been in abnormal situations and they are reacting normally to them and the more people are able to talk about that rather than you know and we and we've seen a surge in, in lads topping themselves and it's it's fucking horrendous and you know, if if a couple of guys have spoken up because of some idiot running around a marathon with body armor on, then fucking great. That's the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's just you know, I've as I'm sure you have, you know, you, you've seen the back end of it, like myself as well. Like you know, I, I was in a fucking shit situation when I was still in, um, and I didn't know how to deal with it, and then. Yeah, kind of lapsed when I left as well, and then sort of got a grip of it through support. Our parents kind of helping me out. Yeah, and you know, if I could kind of preach that message to everyone who I was with, and and future and everything else of, listen, you don't have to just you know stand there and, and take it. Like you can speak to people, um, and you and you need to talk about it. It's as simple as that, and it, it, it's not you know sitting in a hospital cubicle like telling a doctor that you feel a bit sad and you drink too much no shit it's about you know putting things in place and, and being proactive about how you're going to help yourself there's so many so much stigma around it mate it's like even just saying there you, know, you, need, to talk, you need to talk about it when, when someone hears that like, you need to talk about it or can I look have a cry on my shoulder no, yeah, no it's yeah. not, not like that like this is exactly what that that means okay so and this is maybe it's the same reason why the podcast is if, if conversations like this happen mm. other people who in our peer group or above or below us who are like fucking fucking 100 they're more likely to be at the very least more aware of themselves right then yeah i was at uh, an event at hr4k you seen it yeah have you been down there i saw you there have you been uh, oh fuck yeah, <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> we spoke about the podcast. Jesus Christ, <laughs> I'm pissed, yeah. Right, so that and Herbie Hydrock. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I know Herb from Morton. Okay, so Herbie. Are we mentioning up? names on this? <laughs> I, I'm happy to mention Herbie. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're You won't mind. I, that's why I, I actually thought it about 30 seconds ago that I didn't mention his name okay. or not. Um, and he, I, I don't know him very well. I didn't know him very well when I was in. We were, we were, we were not friends, you know. We were fucking colleagues as mm. colleagues. Then how did you get in the military? And um, hey, Ginger's got to get annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> and he saw HR HR4K okay, the fucking hell. but we'd, all, we'd been talking about getting him on the podcast mm-hmm. because of all the stuff he's doing yeah he's doing amazing, yeah, amazing stuff Jesus, mental um, anyway so he rocks up and fucking hell Herbie I haven't seen him in since I left yeah, yeah. I fuck knows when the last time I saw him when I was in it could have been three years before I left you know and uh, I said oh, mate how's tricks uh, how are you doing and he didn't say yeah yeah mega mate yeah he said not that great at the minute mate not, not that great and then and then Oh, well, why not? And then we we had we had a conversation, mm. but he wasn't whinging. He was just being honest. Yeah, yeah. And we had a conversation. I like when he said to me, I, I inside I was like fucking smiling. Oh, that was fucking mega. Yeah, yeah. That was mega because he wouldn't. I doubt he would go and speak to someone who was serving like that. He probably was only able to come was able to talk that to me because he's heard me talking about it or mm. guests talking about it. And I thought that's fucking mega. And he's still in. Yeah. And if he's happy. To say that and be honest, and we had a chat about what the dramas were. Yeah. You know? um, then that that means things are going in the right way, without people losing their flipping hard on. You know, yeah, without yeah, people yeah. losing their masculinity or thinking they are. But I don't. Know. But I, I, you know, and I'd I'd really challenge that. You know, a type individual kind of um, you know, masculine, like I'm in the reg and nothing's going to hurt me. That that's what will fuck you. Like that that that's the thing, and you know. Irby's a big lad as well, and you know, physically and, and now mentally. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's funny because now obviously he's an ultra marathon runner and incredibly fit and fucking hell, like he, he does some miles and he's done an incredible, you know, and he's been very open. And I think it's in, it's very inspiring and supportive to a lot of people, past and present. It's, it's looked at the wrong way though, John, right? So it's not looked at the wrong way. It's like, <clears throat> it is looked at the wrong way, but it. That that uh, I'm mega, I'm untouchable attitude. I've got I've got time for that. Right, mm. I've got time for thinking that. Um, I used to be like that. Uh, I wish I had it back, but uh, I wish I had it back. But with the caveat that underlying knowing that I'm not, <laughs> you want it yeah. on the surface, right? But from the mental perspective, it's. I mean, look at the physical perspective. You keep yourself fit. Keep yourself training hard. You want to be as physically fit as you can. You you stretch. Some blokes do yoga, Pilates. You go in the gym. They, they you know they, they keep themselves physically fit, right? And that makes them more capable physically and and mentally. It makes them much more capable than your average average flipping human being, right? Yeah. You do the same with the mind. It's exactly the same thing with the yeah, mind. Yeah. You know, when you see a when you when you when you have an injury, you don't think. Oh, you don't call it. It's not an illness. One of, I mean, one of the things I've been thinking about is what, how about changing from mental illness to mental injury? Yeah, yeah. And then the term injury means it's fixable and is shorter term than what you may think. Illness seems like fuck. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know. I think, I think that's a whole train the mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I think you know the, the point is that um, it, it's very far away from being seen as you know a physical injury and something that you should go and have dealt with mm. because yeah, and I, I'm not. I'm certainly not saying because you know, I think it's tough ass. You know, everyone should should just like start. You know, wearing the heart on the sleeve because because no. a lot of people aren't like that. No. And, and, and I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't say that. But I think that mate, the amount of times, and especially with me sort of sticking my hand up and saying, "Listen, I've had dramas. I've gone to see people about it. I still fucking see someone about it every week." The point is that you know I have lads, and it always happens like this. Blokes are blokes are server mainly. Right, boss, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, good man. I don't know for your ages. How you been getting on? Normally through Insta, but um, I've been getting on, and I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm all right. How are you, mate? Um, yeah, yeah, no, I'm all right. And then you don't hear from them, and then suddenly they come back like a few days later. So, um, do you ever get like dramas mentally, like? And I'm like, right, oh, fucking hell. And then normally on a Sunday evening, I'll get a call. Oh, really? Yeah, but get a call, and it will be, all right, boss. Yeah, I just thought I'd give you a call. All right. What's going on? Then just fucking tears, mate. Really? Yeah. 
and the, I've had a few blokes now because I live in outside Collie there's a few blokes now who have done that and I'm like drop your fucking pen I'm in the car I'll go around and sit and then I'll be like right you need to speak to this person this is how you're going to get help luckily you're in Colchester so support our powers um, and that's why it's a fantastic charity but you know it's it's we fucking looked after each other in uniform why the fuck are we not doing it now and that and, and it it goes, yeah but it goes back to mate I left I left the reg I had, a, I had an awesome time with the reg I served in all three battalions and I I basically didn't have to do an adult job I was a team commander all the way through it was it was awesome and as soon as someone was like oh by the way mate you need to be able to find a desk now I was like nah see you later I'm out um, but I kind of felt the door slam behind me and that's not any slight on Italian regiment or the army that's just how it is because you know you, like anyone if they're out the team then the team's got to move on and if you're not playing in the game then we can't focus on you so we've got to keep moving and I completely get that but there should be a better network outside to support people so I left and I like all good uh, things was in a pub with a Hereford Paul bootneck and, and me and uh, we basically formed the Airborne Business Group which was oh, I've heard of that. we'll get all of those individuals in one room and we'll get a load of business leaders and we'll just make a network because business leaders want to get you know highly capable individuals let's face it not for you know six figures who are driven determined and will learn and yes they don't have the city experience but they will get there and actually when they get to the management level they'll fucking nail it and they're very adaptable mm -hmm. because you know the, what I found in my sort of civic career is people go oh you're in the military oh are you able to learn new things you're like I fucking learn new things in the <laughs> army every single day I'm on a two year rotation every two years you're doing something else and you have to be the SME in it as soon as you move yeah. it's like oh you're now OC Mortars brilliant you're an expert in Mortars you know you're in the CO's tack and he's like uh, MH uh, right so we've got more line here here and here uh, what's the uh, maximum range and all this sort and you're like <laughs> you know and with the blokes like you know you're on the mortar line and lads are doing you know you're doing a, a, a full like fire plan and you know you expect to cut the mustard so you're very adaptable and you're able to change and adapt uh, uh, and move on um, so so you know I kind of built that network and that was really great but it was all non-profit and um, it sort of built my network exponentially and I really saw the power of networking if there's one bit of advice I'd give to someone leaving the military it's learn how to network and do it fucking well bit pesty everyone thinks they're good at Excel when they leave the military because they've done you know flight manifests and stuff like that you don't know anything get good at Excel get good at date person you saw what you spoke about and when you next see them even colour code it so if you haven't updated in a couple of weeks it goes red all of those sort of things just doing the basics well following up with people everything else that's what I did and, and it, it, it just grows and people see that you're actually a capable individual and then they take you more seriously hopefully I'm still working on that <laughs> um, but um, yeah and, and all that sort of thing so, so I still like deal with people who are leaving and transitioning you know as and when um, but you know I find that I find it really important I think it's really important you know there, there are a lot of officers and NCOs and, and you know blokes that leave and you know they just need the heads up on, on what to expect because it's not easy no it's not. and it takes a long time for it to get out of your system <clears throat> yeah I think a lot of the problem we're, not a lot of problem a lot of uh, you get a you get a high percentage of you get a high percentage of people who are fucking speculating yeah you probably get a high percentage of people who who, have, who struggle with the transition on the outside a high percentage of them have been on tours yeah. operational tours you go well that's a no brainer you, you, it isn't it isn't and it, it these are people who talk about I haven't necessarily got PTSD which is always PTSD, PTSD mm. like no that's not the only mental Ill, illness that exists yeah okay. yeah one of the things I realised is that um, I, when I, I found myself you know in, over the years I can help looking back fondly on tours why do I look back fondly on what was like fucking hideous man yeah. you know don't get yeah, me wrong yeah, yeah. I did not enjoy it at the time 
I didn't not enjoy it but I didn't enjoy it it's just it's, I'm there yeah. I'm going to do a job and, and that's it but I look back and go oh, man, I fucking wish I was back there even I remember after the, the first tour after the first Afghan tour like, fuck, in between that you're yeah, in between yeah, that yeah. and the second tour yeah. all I want to do is be back there I didn't want to come back yeah. it's like why so you did why four, is that? eight and then 13. 13 why is that and it's I used to say because it's a simple like, I, I do yeah, say yeah. it's a simple that's like, what I love it's fucking black yeah. and white yeah. black and white you know, if you're good at your job as well, it's second nature to you. So you don't even really have to worry about that. And and it's, you haven't got all the stresses of being back in the UK. Like that is part of it. It's part it's of a life sabbatical. Life. Yeah, exactly. That is part of it. Even more so now with, mm-hmm. with all social media information going bad, but you get your in normal life. But there's another part to it. Is that all the things that we're fond of in the military, camaraderie, comradeship, flipping common bond, mutual trust. You know all that stuff. Some you, steroids you, on tour. Yeah, that on tour that gets chucked through the roof. Yeah. It's like it cannot get any better. Yeah, that kind of camaraderie and everything that entails cannot get any better. Yeah. So if you've experienced that at that those high, 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 high levels, when you leave, it becomes even harder to integrate. Not because you've been shot at. Not because you've you know seen your mates blown up, or whatever. But because you've, been you've experienced very... the, the very highest. Of, of a social of, of what a society can exist it's just yeah, what yeah. it is how human beings can so it, well, it's very, arguably it's very primal very in its primal. existence yeah. and, and I think that's you know with the type of individuals we are we you know that's why it's uh, you know, incredibly uh, inspiring and, and you know it, it's you leave and, and you know I remember like going on tour or whatever and then coming back or you go on exercise and come back and all you want to do is go on the piss with the blokes and you know your friends and family are like you've just been with them for that amount of time like why do you now want to go on the piss with them surely you've run out of things to say and you're like no because it's a decompression element that we need to do um, so you know I did uh, Eric 13 over I was, I was probably the other side of where you are on, yeah. on the corridor are you that my gas Oh, no, that was uh, no, 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 south of Price, mate. So, so, so literally snack, eastern yeah. flank. So we have um, basically when the when the coalition runs out of people to put somewhere, they call it like a battle box. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's the ops box. Ops box. Oh, it's an ops box. Basically, you don't have the fucking people to put there, and it's really shit. So you just call it an ops box. So we're on a border of an ops box. So essentially, you just get all the fuckers coming in from the east, coming up, hitting the helmet. Helmand, we were on the Helmand Riviera and they, you know, they come and smash us. So I kept us busy and uh, I was doing the ANA mentoring. Um, so the ANA was actually, there was a Kandak and it was only under us. But because of that, we were, we were basically, we turned up in an area, there was a town, a uh, ghost town full of IEDs, no locals there. Mission, clear the IEDs, bring the locals back. You know, brilliant. Okay. In six months, yeah, no, no problem. All right. Uh, so we turn up, obviously, you know, Terry Taliban cutting a bow, you know, putting IDs where he wants. You know, we start removing that, but that's very tricky. We then start bringing locals back. That's very tricky. We then still had a huge Taliban presence, you know, and it was on a cyclical basis. And they had wonderful routes in and, you know, it's basically like a playground. Um, so it's very reactive, that tour. And unfortunately, we had some, you know, serious injuries and fatalities and actually... <coughs> You know, right at the end of my tour, because um, I basically uh, one para needed a, a, an officer to go on the next tour. I think he got injured or something. So we get this fastball. Right, one of you, one of the lieutenants is going to go over to one para, and you're basically going to go on tour straight away. Who wants it? So I believe the lieutenant's like, yeah, get me on that. I've just been in theatre five months, but yeah, get me on that without really thinking. And um, <sighs> So I get lifted, I, I get the place and get lifted off the ground. And uh, yeah, basically the day that I step off the ground, I'm in, I'm in uh, Bastion Scoff House. And uh, my flight was that evening, back to the UK. Um, and uh, mate, Op Minimise comes on. Uh-huh. And I, I, you know when you feel it, and I was like, it's fucking one of mine, it's one of my blokes. And I rush out that Scoff House, mate, and I run down to two paras battle group headquarters and I go who is it and they were like what and I was like who is one of ours who, who is it and they said the zap number and I knew exactly who that was like one of my boats so I literally fucking run back to 
the hospital Nightingale HLS and uh, two para um, guys are up there and they go uh, boss do you know him and I'm like yeah he's one of mine they go okay can you identify the body oh, like, fucking hell fucking hell he's fucking dead he's fucking alive what the fuck they go yeah he is and they were like fuck obviously they didn't mean to say body to me but they did yeah so anyway he comes off the uh, back of the lift uh, um, Mert and uh, put an ambulance and then you know those doors open I hadn't really prepared myself at all um, and you know at that time like it was just belt fed US guys because they were taking it, they were doing a job in Sangin at yeah. the time doing a push up there okay, horrendous so like you know Bastion Hospital is rammed it's chaos like absolute chaos and fuck me Clara and fucking bits of kit everywhere um and uh, yeah, anyway, lad comes off the back of the ambulance, and I'm like, yeah, that's him. And I was fine. <laughs> Turn around, and I see everyone else's faces, which were just like, <laughs> and I was like, I literally felt I was going to pass out. And I went round the corner, and I, I think I fucking just like dropped to my knees and just couldn't stop myself. Mm. And uh, so someone came around, they were like, right, you're right. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And they go, uh, okay, he's gone in, this is what's going to happen. And I couldn't really hear them. I just went into the hospital and I was like, right, he's in uh, he's intensive care. They're putting units for him. And I just walked in, mate, up to the table, and like like the PJs normally do. So they were sort of used to having military people around, but they didn't realise I wasn't a me- medical person. So I walked straight in. And I was just like, keeping my hand on him. He was out. He had to get restarted. And, um, and yeah, I kind of got that view of you know my guy until someone turned around and went who the fuck are you <laughs> and I just went oh, I'm his boss and they were like get outside so I then was outside you know they stabilised him to a point but he was still in a coma essentially and then he was in the you know main kind of area and at that point I was sort of going around the rest of the wards and seeing the blokes who I knew you know very different to how I remember them and uh Anyway, my flight was, was flying that evening and all my kit and my Bergen had been whatever and was on that lifter. And the uh, the medical staff were like, oh, are you uh, Lieutenant Norton Andrew? You need to get on your flight. And I was like, there's no fucking way I'm leaving it. And they're like, right. <laughs> so they escalated it, got a major, told me, and I was like, I'm not fucking leaving him. They eventually get like the main guy and I was like, there's no way I'm leaving. I need to go, oh, I need to stay with him. So they let, to be fair, they left me. And they took my Bergen off the plane. And uh, I don't know, I, honestly, mate, I don't know. Time just didn't exist then. And then um, uh, they say, right, we're flying him back on CCAS. So I hurt straight back to Birmingham. He'd just come off R&R. He'd had a two week year old child. Yeah. So we, we basically saved his R&R up right until the end. And then uh, put him on R and R, uh, and so he could see the you know, birth of his child. Oh, came right, back yeah. to Clinton. Yeah. and uh, yeah, so so we went back to Birmingham. Um, that was fucking weird, mate, as well, because you're on a CCAS full of blokes in a coma, but doctors working, hammer and tongs, mate. Honestly, no what? one on the plane. On the plane, no one sees us. No one sees it. Go on. Well, they don't. Like, why would you? Because if you're on that plane, you're either medical or you're a bloke in a coma getting worked on so you're you're a guy that basically, not operations though huh not operations on the plane oh mate they were like keeping blokes going putting really? units through them yeah yeah okay. they were working hard no sleep constantly on I was like fucking hell no one sees that and um, my uh, my my Sisters, happy. My brother-in-law was an air med. Phenomenal, honestly, phenomenal. I just, yeah. I mean, the work capacity of them, the concentration. Like, bearing in mind, you got turbulence and everything else. You know, they had like knives out and doing stuff, and they they kept them all going, mate. Anyway, landed in Birmingham. I think it was early doors on our like weekday. Landed Birmingham Hospital. You know, hurt just. Really? Yeah. But on the on the pan, Birmingham, Birmingham Airport, sorry. So we landed, you know, the back goes down. It's fucking freezing cold in the UK. <laughs> hey, I'm generally like still in the kit that I'm standing up in, like a U back and 
you know, yeah. all this sort of stuff, Guinness. And, uh, you know, get in the back of a blue light ambulance and you have a police escort, all the motorbikes, and then you get blue lighted all the way to Queen Elizabeth. And then, uh, you know, I sort of stayed with them all the way through, go through the door, and um, they go, right. And they literally pulled my hand off the gurney and they were like, oh, that's it now. And uh, put his uncle was killed in the Falklands. So I knew the family very well because wow. they'd come to Goose Green lunches. So the f basically the, the med team or, or whoever it was turned to me and said, the family know you've come back with them. Do you want to go and see them? Or, or they want to see you. And I was like, well, if they want to see me, fine. I mean, I don't want to see, like I, I don't know. I'd slept for days. Um, and basically they went, right, before you go in, you cannot say anything can't say anything medical because you're not a medic you, you basically can't say anything about the injuries and you certainly can't say anything about his condition and I'm like okay so I walk in obviously you know, family devastated asking questions and I'm just sitting there being like you know he's a mega bloke and he's you know it's good and, uh. but the problem is I'm the first face they see so they always see me and remember yeah so that was very hard as well later on I didn't survive so um, the family then went to see him and uh, basically put his child in his arms and he, he went. Um, uh, did he die in, he died in Africa? He, no, he died in Birmingham. In, in Birmingham. So um, yeah, and then uh, basically the duty driver's there. I get in the car, get taken to Collie, get to my room at like 2 a.m. Your room's already boxed up, isn't it? Because no one wants to box your room if you're brown as. Um, next day, I get in my car and I drive to Wales. Turn up, turn up in Wales, mate. First brief. Fucking eight hours a bit long, isn't it? <laughs> Go get a haircut. All right. Uh, and by the way, the whole company's on on exercise, so you're going to go and join them. Throw him straight back in, mate. Four months later, I'm back in theatre. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, which which was cathartic in a way, because it's like, and we were so reactionary on Herrick, but on those tours, you are proactive. And fuck me if you want to get a job done, especially with the shit that I went through, you fucking got it done. Mm. Um, and it was an incredible seven eight months. Um, you know, we were basically doing the op lines at other forces would be doing in that group uh, we were very fortunate to get it um, but it's mainly down to the fact that you know all the guys there so we were a bootneck marine um, bootneck and reg kind of mix and rough no we didn't have those because we weren't in that company ah, okay. um, we took over from them um, but the uh, all those bootneck lads have been on Herrick 12 one before us and all the reg blokes have been through a few rotations so it was like we know what it's like we've lost blokes we've done the other part of the business you know we, we're seasoned now we know what we're getting up to and uh, mate I sort of came in with just like right this is it let's fucking go clearly in the most professional way possible but we had a job and we were very good at doing it and it was a wonderful period of time and you sort of come off the back of that like long rotation you know and I've been over a three year period in Afghanistan um, and then you come back to crashing back down to reality um, and you know I remember reading a book called Scars of War all about the study of sort of you know American soldiers in Vietnam and there's one bit that's you know really stuck with me it's Scars of War Scars of War yeah by a guy called Hubert Manners and uh, you know, when you go to war, you take out a debt, and when you come home, you pay it back. Fucking hell, that resonated. Um, because that's very much what happens. You know, you come back off that adrenaline high for a long period of time. In that, you know, and and bearing in mind my second, that other tour was was incredibly punchy, and I lost guys on there, and I, things happened that were fairly significant. Um, and. Uh, you know, you come back and you start processing that, and you start going, "Fuck, my life's never going to be like that again." Mate, I was 25, and I was like, "I'm actually." I remember going, um, 
and reading another book by a, a Second World War Spitfire pilot and actually going to see him speak in London and he talked about basically having a mental breakdown at 24, 25 because he was like I've experienced more of life than I ever will again and I can't cope how do you how do you match it well, I, I, it just clearly, you know, that's a very different situation. But I felt in my own way. No, that's what I mean, I, I, that's what I mean. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 yeah, I understand what you're saying. It's, uh, when I did, I did Iraq War, twenty-two, and then twenty-one, and then the first Falklands. First Falklands. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you're about okay, the eighteen. First, uh, first Afghan, Age was twenty. Yeah. First Afghan was twenty four. Yeah. How would you? I completely. What? What? The thing is, you had on that on Eric four as well, mate. Like you, uh, you didn't know. Like at least I knew. Done Afghan. Shit's going to go down. With you guys, you were you patrolling with floppy hats for the fucking first half. <laughs> maybe fucking. Carry well, you on. probably never put a helmet on, did you? Fucking been. Maybe been. Didn't you put been, CBA on? No, you've been the you've been the CBA. Jesus, you've been the CBA, mate. They were the. Well, C- the, CBA is about as useful as putting a notepad in your pocket. That 0406 tour was like, ugh, it's the, it's just the best. I, I, I'm very fortunate, in a way, mm. to have experienced the, the start of that campaign and the end of the campaign, the transition through the whole thing from how how close to you know war kind of combat it can be. Mm. The transition all the way through to the a tour in the middle of the campaign, a tour toward the end, to the transition, not just in how the UK were dealing with things, or um, yeah, UK were dealing with things, and from kit we were issuing and tactics we were taking, but also to the change in tactics adopted by the Taliban. Yeah, and that that first tour, um, didn't we have to start worrying about IEDs until towards no. the end? They were there. No. But we didn't. It wasn't. It didn't. It, the threat didn't override. It, it didn't. It didn't dictate. Policy. Wasn't that big to go right now? Just cover ourselves yeah. in fucking body armor. Yeah, and, yeah. And Valen and everything. It wasn't yeah. like that. And we were going to. We were going to. There was a point in the tour where Tootle turned around and said, "Right, body armor. If you want to wear it, it's yeah, your, it's it's your commander's to decision." Gra- Grandpa's commander. Yeah. Hey, we'd get on and we'd, yeah. we'd get in Chinook's land and get off and be a pile of be a pile of body armor. We'd leave it. Yeah. We'd go in with no body armor. Yeah, because we could move faster. Because you're fighting people in dish sashes and fucking flip flops, mate. Yeah, there, I mean there, there there is a there is a balance. That worked then. It would yeah. not work now. But but also, you know, on on my latter tours, I'm wearing a plate carrier. Yeah. With a weapon that weighs as much as your mobile phone. Yeah. With yeah. a helmet that weighs yeah. as much as this. What are you on the Marcos? Yeah. 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 CAs. And uh, you know, fuck me, mate. I could I could run. I could throw, <laughs> yeah. I could kick doors in. I could actually yeah. do what I need to do as a soldier. Yeah. Uh, in Osprey, I mean, Possibly. mate, on it, like getting off a knee, and you're doing that what, fifty times a patrol. Yeah. It's just, and and you know, Eric thirteen was winter, so your waterlogged fields. Yeah. You know, um, but on Eric thirteen, we um, we're in a very heavily IED place and they could canalise us very well because they knew the routes of ingress and egress and everything else like we were very much playing in their backyard they knew it and so you know I don't care who you are or, or how much of a you know Sun Tzu you think you are you're not going to outwit someone whose backyard basics is is you know and they've dictated the land so we'd have to get very smart about how we do it and catching them in an ambush I only did it once You'd never catch them out. Impossible. Yeah, it's it's impossible. impossible. Um, never ever, you know, underestimate your enemy. But also, they knew exactly what our tactics were. But there are there are points, significant points, on that tour where the policy of valoring everywhere you go went out the window because we couldn't do it. And if we had done it, it would have caused casualties and death. The way that you circumvent, and I said this, I, the blokes were, you know, we taken over from a, a unit that had, had a crunchy time. Now I'd largely put it to them that they got lazy, they set patterns, and they didn't patrol towards the end of their tour. So the Taliban encroached onto the PV massively, 
And so lads were getting shot at the gate. There were IEDs 10 meters out of Sangers, all of that sort of stuff. That is not because the enemy has got better, it's because you have got worse. So we had to kind of push that back. The point is that the lads were shaken at the beginning and they were like, fucking hell. Literally, you, you, you're brief that you walk out the, day, uh, the gate, you're going to get shot in the face and you're going to step on an IED. And I said, unless we're doing every patrol and we're coming back and we are licked and we're head to toe in water, I haven't done my job properly because if we're setting patterns, then that's how we get caught out. So we, we take the hardest route every time. Um, and we never found an IED with a Valen. We found 13 IEDs, I'm lucky for some. Um, but they were all done by ground sign and then, you know, confirmation. But, you know, they got so smart with their, you know, we had the like two CDs, ball bearings in between, tilt switch, all of those sort of things. You know, and then you get on a call and you call in who were they? The counter ID guys. Eight yeah, but they had a they had a name. Oh, the high 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 risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, I'd incredibly respectful. I had, uh, I had um, a guy called Mickey Yule on. Mm. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He was a high risk high yeah, risk yeah, yeah. Fucking double amputee. Yeah, yeah. Have you listened to that podcast? Yeah, I have. Yeah, like, yeah. Fucking bloke. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, he's powerlifting now, isn't he? That's it. Um, yeah, no, incredibly inspirational people and, and a tremendous amount of courage because they are literally going from zero to 100 quicker than a Bugatti Veyron. Whereas we're kind of patrolling every day and we see it and it's not too much of an increase in terms of stress and anxiety, but for them it is. I, I found, I found it, sorry, I found it, I found my, my temperament on the tours, just, it was just calm. Yeah. I, I just, it, abnormal. Uh, I look back and it was a it was a, co- it was a coping mechanism. Yeah. But it was just complete calm, complete calm, and and it would go down another two notches when shit hit the fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Complete calm. But that, I mean, you know, that is weird. weird. Well, but that it, hit me yeah. later on. Yeah, later yeah. No, it does. And it, yeah, and I it. kind of did the same because you never want to shout contact weight out on the net when you're flapping because <laughs> it panics a man. I did, that's it, yeah. and you get rinsed. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't worried about. Oh God, you know. I was like, catch your breath, don't panic. Contact weight out. <gasps> Even when we're getting shot at, it's like you've got to deliver it because the blokes will rinse you if you're like, ah, contact weight. <laughs> I elevated my voice. I did. I elevated my voice once mm. doing that once, and it was. Uh, I was gutted. Yeah. And it was picked up straight away. You never forget it. Stop flapping, like, fella. Calm the day, <laughs> and it was a laugh tour, and it was. Uh, what happened? I was, it was, I was in a, we were in a compound. I was, uh, like in the co- on the ground. Like I see, yeah, the, the guys in the roof or on protection, and uh, on the roof, the walls, and uh, contact kicked off. And at the time, it was fucking stupidity. Not it was three power. It was a, it was a, it was a uh, uh, higher thing, where they had when you report the contact, you had to say if it was green, amber, or red. Do you remember that? What? Oh my. So if you report Sounds the contact, shit, it's courageous yeah, it's strange. stupid fucking shit. It wasn't again. It was like higher, higher. Like it was like a you got contact. I uh, contact fucking small arms, green or amber or red, and green, amber or red indicated how much of a threat the fire was. Yeah. Yeah. So as in, how close to your troops was it? Was yeah, it indiscriminate? Yeah. I was like, but it just fucking fucking contact to contact. But to be fair, you've been shot enough times to know actually if it is close or not. Yeah, I had. Yeah. But not all the fucking guys. No, no, you know what I mean? No, like, no, so at yeah, that yeah. point, because of the way it's gone, probably thirty yeah. percent of. And you know what weapon system it is because of the way they're firing it, and if <laughs> the round's tumbling or if it's yeah, just a high yeah, velocity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, fucking contact happens. This round's come over the top of the compound. I like can see like, going on like that. Uh, contact small arms red, and as I said red. <laughs> Stop flapping! <laughs> now, as I said, red. No, I was sound. I was calm. Mm. As I said, red. Uh, I forgot we were recording. It. I thought we were like, chat. As I said, red. Um, more rounds got f- were fired and bounced off. They basically hit the wall in front of one of my guys in front of the end. The fucking wall. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, uh, so uh, contact small arms red. Very red. Very red. <laughs> very, red. <laughs> very red. Very red. Very red. <laughs> Honest to God, yeah. and then uh, I, th- I thought, oh no! And we got into the contact and go back to camp, and, it, and we had the OCs 
DB. Uh, Todd, have you come across? Toddy, Toddy the OC. Hates. Todd, have you come across Story. Toddy? That's a different podcast. Right? Oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> that is a podcast that I don't right. think. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and it came out in the OC's debrief. Uh, we contact. Uh, it was very, very red. Very red, Sergeant Gear. <laughs> very red. <laughs> Fuck off. Fuck off. <laughs> Yeah, if it's one, you he had some wonderful it. team commanders in that company as well. What, and what's and two ICs. Well, in uh, A company. In yeah. Toddy. Uh, yeah, I had. Uh... Shit, who were the platoon commanders? Can't remember platoon commanders. Two IC was Clampy. Two IC was Clampy. Yeah, who were yeah. the platoon commanders? Let's just, let's just say nicknames. Hig? Hig? No. If that, it's irrelevant because people yeah, are not yeah, yeah, about it. irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, no, calm and then, and then, but he was a, he was a flat, and that, that, um, that calmness, and like I say, it would drop down two notches when when the shit hit the mm. fan. That carried on into my civil life. So uh, if it was a, I mean, in inverted commas, a disaster like one of my kids would fall over and fucking blood gushing everywhere or they'd, they'd fucking smash the yeah, leg yeah. and they'd be like, oh you come across the, mate I mean, you know how many times I've come around the corner and there's fucking cyclists they knock off their bikes and they'd be clipped yeah, yeah, by a yeah, car yeah, yeah. so those kind of things and go straight and it's my brain switches off yeah. like and the emotions switch up go on calm though yeah. I remember being a, like one cyclist like, pull over pull over rapid like, pull over, took the kids sit in the car kids car was like they walk out there start dealing with the casualty yeah, yeah. get back in thinking, yeah, Crazy. yeah, Crazy. yeah. No, I'm not, it's I'm, really good. Yeah, it's it's it's, yeah, it's really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess you know, same as you. Like I really noticed it when, um, yeah, when you're dealing with something because I obviously do London to you know St Athens and, and Wales. So you're on the M4, and the amount of fucking collisions going on there. Mate, uh, I, I had a trauma kit in the back. Actually, I saw you Welsh actually, locker. actually. <laughs> I haven't done a speed awareness course recently. Only on. only five percent of all accidents are on motor roads. They're the safest place to drive. Well, 5%. I'd see I'd see if anyway I'd see a few early, like early doors Monday morning. Well, on the path of stair. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, there was this one uh, you know like uh, someone had come off hit hit the centre reservation like air and everything else they're, they're in clip you know face smashed up. I sort of still get back in the car. Absolutely, literally didn't think again about it. I get like you know the windy roads off the M4 in South Wales, miss a turning, mate. I literally ripped the steering wheel out of the fucking socket and like fucking pounding the dashboard. I was like, okay, she was turning. I've literally and gone absolutely mental about it. Oh really? Yeah, I was like, uh, uh. maybe, maybe I've got dramas. <laughs> oh well, let's just park those because I've got to go on tour again. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be fine. You're still in. It'd be it's fine. Gone. Yeah, it's fine. Blokes. Yeah, and the best bit. Yeah, why am I sad? I've just been actually crikey. I've, I've. <laughs> we've got a. We haven't got long. Well, I think we've got long after we start wrapping up soon. But one of the things I want to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. Um. One of my opinions on. Uh, one of my. One of my opinions. Yeah. One of the things I always thought, and this is based on my own experiences, um, obviously, is that. People who have had the responsibility of command um, in high stress situations, fire service, police, mm. military, tours, yeah, are more, I think they're more susceptible, more, uh, not susceptible, more likely to suffer the effects of mental ill health as a result of those, uh, as a result of the experiences on tour. And the reason I say that is, and that's based on my experience, is that uh, calmness. But I think that when you commander, your sense of responsibility and your, the, the, the pure amount of thinking you have to do constantly mm. on tour, which is not a role revolves around your emotions, it revolves around tactics and strategy, your blokes, how to manage your blokes, how to manage your commanders, how to manage the other, other commanders you're dealing with, other platoons and your platoon commanders with the company commander you know what's happening in the future how do I how do, it's all about the real picture tactical situation on the ground how am I going to achieve the next mission and I plan for it and also how do I deal with how, how do I man manage you know that, I mean, that was one of the most hardest man management tasks ever manage a task just 
just the emotional side yeah. alone how to get the best of blokes I want to fucking tour like that or your ladies you know yeah. um, and so I think that emotions are, are much less addressed by people in command positions or positions of high responsibility so uh, an, R, an, an RQMS a CQMS for example or a, or, a, or, a, or a fucking signaler yeah yeah for example yeah. high position responsibility don't get a lot of time themselves to fucking to not to think but to be aware of what's going on yeah whereas as a Tom you do get that time yeah. so, I, so I think that commanders are, are much more susceptible to mental ill health I, that may be wrong delayed that's onset me saying. delayed onset I think you're delayed right delayed onset yeah. yeah but also you know yeah the bloke goes on the ground comes back and he's clearing his muckers bed space and then he has to look at the empty bed space yeah. and his mate that he went through depot with is no longer there and he focuses on that mm. and that's fucking hard mm. and he's got to motivate himself every single day to go and do the job that you know in that instance I was standing in front of them and telling them that's what was going to happen mm. and this is the reason we're doing it and end of the day the blokes are like I'm fucking bored of listening to him um, how long am I going to be on the ground for what do I need to take and am I going to get fucking killed this time and I think you know I was in a, a phenomenally fortunate position to be in command of paratroopers and, and latterly marines um, and, and other units as well and seeing how that all gels together but I was incredibly cognizant of the emotional response of individuals and the pressures that they're under and what they were under uh, or, or how, how because we're all part of the same situation but in terms of how that affects us was very different because people have different roles in what happened or you know for some reason I was involved in some very like significant things that fucking went wrong and it wasn't anyone's fault it was just another fucking day in Afya um, and you know we were called to certain things that were ended up being a lot more graphic and, and crunchy than we thought they would be um, but we're also putting ourselves out there to be in that position I'm talking about you know the other the other tools after Area 13 um, and you know coming back and kind of doing a bit of a when you're doing a debrief you know looking around the blokes and being like right well let's just have a fucking chat how do you think that went or or how are you feeling about that we've just seen this happen it's it's not pleasant um, and we were kind of doing that organically and I think okay. that was crucially important because I'd seen what happened on my first tour okay um did I do it right? Did I do it wrong? I don't fucking know. I've not heard that being done before. It yeah. Might, I'm not, that's not that's what I to, to, to be fair, sense, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because I was just like, you know, it's 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 very un what we were doing to do that. Um, and then we had, we had like some fucking psych nurse come up to, because we'd been involved in a few incidents and, and you know, unfortunately there were casualties. Um, and we had one of these psych nurse, like trim practitioners come into the unit um, and they sort of came in and I remember this bloke fucking sitting there and going yeah so uh, uh, how are you guys feeling and and then the I, trim practitioner said that oh yeah 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 <laughs> and like Jen like a pasty male fat bloke in a U-back shirt and all the blokes were like boss is this Jen and I was like just fucking go along with it it's for your own good so we sort of went along with it and then I think I was getting the most annoyed with him because then he go, mate. And the thing that fucking turned it for me was he goes, he goes, yeah, well, you know, um, if any, if you have problems, you know, I think there's like, you know, there's a really nice scoff house that you got here. And we were like, yeah, yeah, no, it's actually the chefs you know, take out blind and do really well. Yeah, well, you know, if you're cutting into your steak tonight and you're thinking, and I was like, you fucking shut up. I was oh like, God. are you fucking mental? Jesus Christ. So I start saying that shit. Because that's Jesus just going to be embellished Christ. in my fucking Except brain. And now I can't me. eat fucking steak. You dick! <laughs> that's all I look forward to. Um, so those sort of things, you know, are, are quite important. But I, but I think, you know, doing... Just, just being like... Uh, and, and we couldn't do it every time. You know, there is a time where you just got to pull up trousers and go, right, you fucking crack up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Time and place. Um, and, and those... And again, the... the those kind of uh, addressing the, the emotional aspect of dealing with trauma, fucking trauma. Um, 
there mm. are uh, traumatic events, I should say, traumatic events, right? And, and sorry, it's, it's just on the just on the traumatic events. You and I would admit, perhaps previously say traumatic event. Uh, what's that? Traumatic. Uh, well, I've not. I lost a leg. I've never been shot. Uh, no, I've not had any traumatic events. Now, when I went through my, my first time in, in cancer, and uh, I was she the lady. She said she said. I can't remember she came up anyway. Ended up talking around Mac and stuff, and she, I said I can't fucking I, I don't understand why I'm the way I am. I've got no issue. You know, I just talk. You know. I don't understand why this is happening. And she said, but, you, but can you understand what you're talking about as traumatic events? I said, it's not. Yeah. It's not. I don't see it. I, I said, I can understand how it could be seen as that. Yeah. But, but that's me, not what it is. Not how for I, me, it's not. Yeah. She went, no, it, it's you consciously. Yeah, On a subconscious yeah, yeah. level, it is, that is just like a baseball bat to the head. Bam! Yeah. You know? And, and it, it's different for different people. Yeah, yeah. Know? Some people can go over and nearly get hit by a car, but not get hit by the car. Because the car's thrown out the way, and they'll get fucking PTSD, yeah, yeah. or they'll be they'll have anxiety for the rest of their life, or something. You know, other yeah. people, you and I know them, can go and do three, four tours of Afghan, be yeah. in every fucking drama that ever hit the news, right? Yeah. And be walking around like they fucking did be a postman. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, I come to that trauma. Oh yeah, so I come to that traumatic events. Uh, well, just in terms of how one processes it, and I think it's all different. For each individual. Oh, so yeah. So the dealing with the traumatic stuff on an emotional level, that 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 gets that is sort of achieved naturally at a, at a buddy buddy muckers muckers level, you yeah. know, in the in the pit in the basher at the end of the end of the contact. But I've not heard of it being done at, a, at that to command level. Yeah, I'm not saying I I I, I had to do it, mate. Like end of the day, you done. know. You come off the ground. Wrong. No, 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 no. I know, but like it's 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 crazy that it didn't happen more because yeah. invariably we'd be on the ground, we'd come back, and you know, um, we'd be like, "Well, that's debrief of the patrol," and then you know, go and do what you need to do, abandon yourself, and you know, burst into flames, and you know, go and get scoff, come back, um, you know, and I'll I'll, I'll literally brief you on what's going to happen tomorrow, and then we'll go out on the ground again. It's Something's got to give. That is the problem. That's not the got problem. That is the thing. You, yeah. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you, it's a, it's a fine line between trying to uh, address any issues the blokes may have, but also keeping the mindset that, keep the fear away, keep the, keep the fear away and the mindset. Right? It's about, okay, so how are you feeling? You know, not, I'm, I was going to take it. Yeah, yeah. How are you feeling? I don't know, your mate's just been killed. Cool. Right. <laughs> Uh, four four a.m. Yeah, uh, yeah. Up, we're out the door at four thirty. Yeah, yeah. We're going to be doing the same shit again, the same yeah. area. It's just, it might be you. <laughs> it might be uh, you. Hey, here's, yeah. here's a set of dice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know you just got to be going back to what we spoke about right at the beginning. Like you know, I, I think you do feel a bit of the, the weight on your shoulders from a leadership position, and but you know, not at the time, though. Not the time. No, not at the time. But like you know. Why, why did I want to join a unit like the Parachute Regiment? Because I knew that they were going to be, you know, in at the at the at the tip and at the front end, and I knew I'd get the experience that I wanted to. Well, I wanted to deploy. Fuck me, I got that. <laughs> um, you never know how it's going to go down. Um, mate, you need to drink quicker. Fuck me. Do you want one more? No, we don't. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> all right. I pissed my pants for a minute. <laughs> Um, yeah, so like you know, you, you're you're in a position, and I think you've just got to. It's not just you know, take your blokes out every day and give them orders and doing stuff. It's it's all the other things that go with it. Just just being a fucking bloke, and just being you know, understanding that people process things in different ways, and you know, you you've basically been given a tool set, an amazing tool set, and you use different tools for different jobs. Um, and yeah, I had a phenomenal time. I left at the right time. Uh, join Civvy Street and I'm trying to act like a normal person do one <laughs> right. he's too good looking for a normal person yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I get the yellow pages out mate maybe <laughs> um, what have we missed what What do you well shameless plug opportunity shameless plug would obviously support our powers um, I think well I know that if anyone is struggling 
or if anyone just doesn't know where to go, has run out of options, or even if you feel you're getting close to that, then support our paras, go on the website, all the contact information's there. It's through the regimental headquarters. It's, it's run in uh, an incredible way by an incredible amount of people that dedicate their lives to the support of people who, who are serving and have served. Yeah, so um, so to because we a pair. Of, I didn't realize, but we're a pair of people who have been helped by support of parents. Yeah, and um, so on that, what people like one of the issues is people don't realize how much help is available to them. Yeah. Okay, not just financial, from fucking look for work to look, all sorts of shit from from food vouchers, you know, all sorts of stuff. Okay, so an easy way to to, to get a handle on all that is if you've got a issue or. Or maybe you've got to maybe use some business advice. It's not just for when you're on your ass, yeah, yeah. right? Get on to Sir Water Paras, get on to Power Edge HQ. Yeah. Laura McFully, me, yeah, another yeah, one yeah. of it. She has fucking saved my yeah, skin yeah. a bunch of times. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's for us. But in line with, with other people who aren't Power Edge who listen to this, one reason you've got the RMA, the Royal Marine Association. Yeah. First point of call if you don't, if you've got a problem, if you've got an issue, if you're not quite sure what the fuck is going on, you just need. You just need some advice on anything. Your first point of call needs to be your your, your, your regiment, it's your regiment, your unit. Or your and then, unit. well, this is the thing. So I've referred. You know, they're not just power edge people that I speak to, or have spoken to me. And if you go through your, go through the regimental system, and by the way, funnily enough, our welfare, the reg welfare system, knows all the other welfare systems. Um, so they can just plug you in. I was about I was about to say, all like the experience we have, which is mega with power edge. May not be excluded other units have. I heard yeah. last week. I, I can't remember which unit it was, um, but they were getting nowhere. It was a minor issue. But they were getting nowhere with their, um, their their welfare officer. Exactly what you said. If you ain't getting somewhere with your regiment association, ring someone else. Yeah. Because yeah. all those you will find a, a decent a decent person. They all know exactly like you say the same contacts. Mm. They will point you in the right direction. Yeah. Point you in the right direction. Um, I'll certainly advocate that. And then I guess just like. Um, you know, it's a it's you, you leave the the army regardless of unit with a big puffed out chest and and then that gets deflated when you leave. I don't care who you are, and it's harder for blokes higher up the chain. Um, and I think we should all be there to support each other and help each other transition. And you know, my door's always open. Um, pop my details on the site. Hit me on Instagram. Instagram. Instabook, yeah. <laughs> Hit me on that if you if you you know want anything or if if you think I can help in any, any way. Um, but you know people like uh, Sinita's girls, Fight or Perish. Oh, Fight or Perish. Big fan of Fight or Perish. Oh, go on. Who? Wait, well, that's Reg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. If... Wait, who is my CQ at one point? Is it still in? Yes. Right, we'll talk about that. Then. Yes. So Fight or Perish. Okay. Fight or Perish. Fight or oh no, yeah, Fight yeah, or yeah, Perish. Yeah. Yeah. Fight or Perish. Yeah, no, it's awesome. Um, I'm probably a I bit. Mean, comes to him on. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Of course, yeah. I'm sure he's two on the podcast. No, you haven't. No, he's still there. He's still there. Um, he hasn't. But he's yeah. commissioned. We'll talk about that later. Um, big shout out to Tupara, currently in Kabul. Um, my Fuck mate, Tupara, mate. Fuck I joined Tupara. Shut no. up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> mate, Tupara. I'm joking, Bluesers. <laughs> Tupara, platoon commander. Uh, my OC in two para is now a CA. Who is it? Well, you'll know him as well. The same isn't it? Beyond Captain Airborne. Oh, oh, <laughs> Rimmer. No, Matt Taylor. Rimmer. <laughs> looks like oh, Rimmer off a of red wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like never Fuck heard that. It out. Yeah, mate, you can you can I tell him, him that when you playing rugby. Yeah, Raj, he, was not him face to face. he was not impressed. He was not impressed. So two para CO. Yeah. Rimmer. Enjoy that one yeah, too, yeah. Para. Yeah, Rimmer. I'm sure they will. Uh, so they're obviously doing their uh, Kabul security force at the moment. Yeah. So, stay safe. Uh, stay safe. They're also doing their own charity stuff. I believe Scott Ratcliffe's heading that up. So shout out to him and his efforts. I think you can go through support our paras and find out what they're doing. They're basically tabbing the equivalent back from Kabul to UK. All right. Yeah. On treadmills. Like you treat yourself. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Really, just uh, shout out to the bloke serving and, and past and present. And if you need any help, give me a shout. Your company is IOSEC. IOSEC. IOSEC.UK. I-O-S-E-C.UK. 
Yeah. Okay. We're getting on the Instagram. <laughs> well, I enjoyed that. Yeah, same. Cheers.